Hi there folks and welcome back. In our last lesson we learned how to compute the surface integral of a scalar field, right? We learned how to sort of add up the values of a scalar field over some curved surface S. Well today we're going to extend those ideas to define the surface integral of a vector field. Just like when we define the line integral of a vector field, we're motivated by a very physical problem. So to start things off, let's suppose that we have a vector field f living in R3. At every point x, y, z in its domain, we're going to see a little arrow with three components. Now to understand what it would mean to integrate this vector field over a surface, it'll be helpful to think of f as modeling some type of a fluid flow. Maybe f represents the velocity of air as it circulates throughout some three-dimensional room. Or maybe it represents the velocity of water as it circulates throughout some tank. Let's now introduce the surface S. Suppose that we have some curved surface living in our space, which we're going to think of sort of like a screen or a mesh. It allows the fluid to pass through. Now the fluid might flow through the surface differently depending on where we look. Over here, it looks like the fluid is flowing in this direction, whereas over here, the fluid appears to be flowing in this direction. Also, it flows at different rates. Over here, the rate looks a little bit smaller than the rate over here, right? The arrows are longer. So we want to know, what's the net rate of flow of this fluid as it passes through the surface S? Does it tend to flow more in this direction or this direction? And by how much? That's the question we're trying to answer. To solve this problem, it'll be helpful to zoom in on one of our velocity vectors to get a better view. As you can see, this vector can be broken down into two components. There's the tangential component, moving the fluid along the surface S, and then there's the normal component, moving our fluid perpendicular to the surface S. It's this normal component that we're interested in. This is the force that pushes our fluid through the surface. As we've seen in the past, we can obtain this component of velocity using a dot product. If this vector here is a unit normal vector to our surface, so it has norm 1 and it's perpendicular to S at this point, then this component of our force is really f dot n. It's f dot n at the point x, y, z. So to determine the net rate of flow through this surface S, we effectively want to add up these forces f dot n over the entire surface itself. Ah, but if we're adding up these values over the entire surface, we're really computing a surface integral, right? We're computing the surface integral of this scalar field, f dot n. And this, folks, is what we define to be the surface integral of our vector field. We define the surface integral of the vector field f over the surface s to be the surface integral of f dot n over s. This is the surface integral of a scalar field, something we know how to handle. It represents the sum of these normal forces to our surface, and therefore it can be interpreted as the net rate of flow of our fluid through the surface S. We sometimes refer to this as the flux of our vector field. Finally, we give this surface integral its own special notation. We denote this quantity by the double integral over S of f dot ds. This is purely notation, and this is what we're going to use to compute it. To evaluate the surface integral of a vector field, we need to be able to find a unit vector n that points perpendicular to our surface, right? A unit normal vector. Well, if our surface is parametrized by r of uv, then as we've seen, ru cross rv will be orthogonal to the surface. We could then unitize this vector to get that unit normal vector n. If you think about this for a second though, you'll realize that at any given point on our surface, there are actually two unit normal vectors. If this is one of them, then the other can be obtained by flipping it in the opposite direction, by multiplying it by minus one. So which of these normal vectors should we use? Does it matter? It turns out it does matter. If I draw a velocity vector in both pictures, you can see that in the first case, the normal component of velocity is pointing in the same direction as n1. So the dot product of these vectors will be positive, and hence this velocity will contribute positively to the net rate of flow through the surface. In the second picture, on the other hand, the normal component of velocity is pointing in the opposite direction of our normal vector. And therefore, the dot product here will be negative. This velocity is contributing negatively to the net rate of flow through the surface. 
So we need to decide in advance. Do we want flow in this direction to be considered positive or flow in this direction to be considered positive? The normal vectors give us two possible orientations for our surface. And when solving problems, you'll be told which orientation to use. So let's first consider the simple case where we're dealing with the graph of a function, z equals f of x, y. If we use the standard parametrization for such a surface, x, y, f of x, y, then we've seen that rx cross ry can be given by this expression here. And therefore, a unit normal vector to our surface is n equals rx cross ry divided by the norm of rx cross ry. Notice that if we compute the normal vector in this way, we're always going to get a positive value for our z component, which means the normal vector is pointing upward from our surface s. We call this upward or positive orientation. If instead we want the normal vector going the other way, well, then we can multiply our result by minus 1. We call this downward or negative orientation. Of course, not every surface we work with is going to be the graph of a function z equals f of x, y. In that case, we can't use our cute little square root formula for finding the normal vector, and instead we have to compute this cross product from scratch. The one exception to this rule, of course, is the sphere of radius a, since we've worked with this surface several times before. If we parametrize the sphere using spherical coordinates, then as we saw in a previous example, the cross product of r phi and r theta is given by this nasty vector here, and its norm is a squared sine phi. You're welcome to use these facts without re-deriving them every time. It's a real pain in the butt. So if we're looking for a unit normal vector to our sphere, we can use the cross product divided by its norm. That gives us the vector sine phi cos theta, sine phi sine theta, and cos phi. Now, does this normal vector give us upward orientation or downward orientation? Well, those terms made sense when dealing with the graph of a function, but they don't really make sense for a surface like a sphere. A sphere is an example of what we call a closed surface. It's just a shell, it has no thickness, but it encloses a 3D space. For closed surfaces, we have two different types of orientation. We have outward orientation, which we're going to consider to be positive, and we have inward orientation, which we consider to be negative. When solving problems with closed surfaces, like a sphere or a cylinder with a top and bottom, you'll always be told whether to use outward or inward orientation. So what about in this example? Is the normal vector that we compute in this way giving us outward or inward orientation? Well, notice that our normal vector n is really just our position vector r multiplied by 1 over a. So it's pointing in the same direction as r of phi theta. Hmm, but r of phi theta extends from the origin to the surface of the sphere. That's how it traces out our surface. So since the position vector is pointing outward, so too is this normal vector. We have outward orientation. If you wanted inward orientation, multiply these vectors by minus 1. Our formula for the surface integral of a vector field cleans up quite a bit when we use this expression for the normal vector. So let's suppose that we're dealing with a parametrized surface S given by R of uv with uv throughout some region d. And it's oriented by this normal vector. Now, of course, if we wanted the other normal vector, we would have to multiply this expression by minus 1. No big deal. If that's the case, then the surface integral of our vector field over the surface S, according to our definition, is the surface integral of f dot n ds. Ah, but n is given by this expression here, which I can substitute into my integral. At this point, we have the surface integral of a scalar field. But I know how to compute that. According to our last lesson, we're supposed to take our scalar field little f, multiply by the norm of ru cross rv, and integrate over d, all possible values of u and v. So this expression here is really this double integral, where I've multiplied by the norm of ru cross rv at the end. But now something amazing happens. We cancel out these norms, and we find that the surface integral of our vector field is really this double integral, the double integral over d of f dot ru cross rv dA. So there's no real need to compute the norm of this cross product. It disappears in our formula. This, folks, is the expression that we're going to use in practice 
to find these surface integrals. I'll end this video with a quick outline of how we compute these surface integrals in practice. If you're trying to integrate a vector field f over a surface s, your first job is to parametrize that surface. If we're dealing with the graph of a function, z equals f of x, y, we should be using the easy parametrization from our second slide. If you're dealing with a sphere or cylinder, you're going to have to be a little more creative. Secondly, we need a vector that points orthogonally to our surface, so we compute r u cross r v. Of course, we have to be sure that it's oriented correctly. This is important. If I ask you for upward orientation, this vector had better be pointing upward. If I ask you for inward orientation, this vector had better be pointed inward. We'll see how we can confirm this in the examples. Finally, we set up and solve our integral. The surface integral of f over s is given by the double integral over d of f dot this cross product dA.